Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast. Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Scipionix, and we have a lot of dinosaur news. But first, I want to point out that we've now gone live on Google Play Music, which is, if you're not familiar with it, the Google platform for music and now podcasts and other things, I suppose, mostly music. It's sort of Google's version of iTunes, and they have a subscription version of music, just like Apple has, and then there's also the standard buy albums there. Now, if you're on a desktop and you click on the panel on the left, you can go down to podcasts. And if you search for dinosaurs anywhere and you scroll down to podcasts, we're the number one result. So that's pretty cool. And we also have a link specifically to our podcast in there. If you use an Android phone that now supports it, they said they're slowly rolling out to phones, so it might not be available yet. But yeah, it might be more convenient for you to listen to us that way. So figured we'd share it here. Yeah. And quick shout out to all of our patrons on Patreon. Thank you so much. We started doing something new. We realized that we post at least a few times a month special posts for our patrons, but we realized, oh, there's a lot of people who visit our Patreon page and you're not a patron. There's not much to see. So we're trying a new thing out and sharing more of our episodes on Patreon. So if you want to see how that looks, check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Jumping into the news, there is a new dinosaur discovery, and we always like to start with those when they're available. Which is pretty much every week. (laughs) Yeah, at least most weeks. This one was described in an article titled, A New Sananothid from Ovaraptorosauria from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation of Alberta, Canada, and a reevaluation of the relationships of Sananothidae. It was published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology, And it was written by Gregory F. Funston and Philip J. Curry. And as the title of the article says, it was discovered in the Horseshoe Canyon, which is in southern Alberta and not far from the Royal Terrell Museum. And Funston, who discovered it while looking at similar dinosaur fossils, works at the Royal Terrell Museum. It was in their collection. And he named it Apatoraptor panatus. And apato means deceptive, and panatus means winged. And the specific name means feathered in Latin. So apparently the deceptive part of the name comes from the fact that it was quote-unquote hiding in a museum since 1993 without being recognized as its own genus. And they believe that it lived about 74 million years ago, and it was originally identified as an unimportant ornithomimid and put into storage partly because they didn't recover the skull, so they weren't really sure exactly what it was, and they just thought it looked similar enough to other ornithomimids that they just kind of put it away, until Funston was looking at it later. Despite the lack of a head, it's a fairly complete specimen. Quote, The partial skeleton is articulated and includes a mandible, a full cervical and dorsal series of vertebrae, a right pectoral girdle and arm, a sternum, gastralia, a partial ilium, and a partial hind limb, end quote. So that's a pretty good selection of parts, and it's a little bit surprising they didn't realize that it was a unique genus earlier. But according to Funston, it's kind of a lesser studied group of animals, so I guess it's not too surprising that they didn't discover it earlier. The thing that makes it a particularly interesting find is that, quote, the arm is well muscled and can be interpreted to have been a penibrachium, end quote. And the penibrachium is the name for a forelimb slash wing structure that's not actually used to fly. And some people use that to describe like an ostrich wing. According to Funston, it was about two meters or seven feet long and weighed about 180 kilograms or 400 pounds. And it wouldn't have been able to fly but it would have used its feathers instead for display, most likely. They found evidence of that strong muscle attachment on its wing slash arm when they were CT scanning the forelimb, but they didn't explain why it would have had such strong wings if not for flight. So my best guess is maybe they were using 
their wing arms for some sort of mating dance where they were doing a lot of flapping around. Or they just worked out. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) But if they weren't flying, it's kind of hard to say what they needed all that muscle for. The ladies. Yeah, could be. Mating display, Mm -hmm. needs strong arms. Not a bad guess. In a more studied group of dinosaurs, there's a new article about theropods. This one's titled, Body Size as a Driver of Scavenging in Theropod Dinosaurs. And it's in preprint in The American Naturalist. I don't think we've talked about that journal before. It was written by Adam Kane and others. And the authors have some experience looking at modern birds and their behavior and scavenging, and they try to use that knowledge to predict how dinosaurs would have scavenged, which is a pretty interesting way to approach it. Makes sense. Yeah, it does. They used a computer model to simulate dinosaurs' scavenging behavior based on their relatives that are still around today, not just birds, other things too. And they calculated how much energy they would have used scavenging compared with how much energy they would gain from the food that they found, which is obviously the most important factor. If it takes you more time and energy to find the food than you get from the food, you're not going to go scavenging. That was basically the premise of their research. The key turned out to be that larger dinosaurs require a lot of food, but moving around also takes a lot of energy, and very small dinosaurs wouldn't need as much food, but they could move around more freely without using as much energy. Unfortunately for the extremes, they found that very large dinosaurs would have expended too much energy while moving around looking for food because of all that bulk they're moving around, and very small animals had difficulty searching enough area to find anything to scavenge. Ultimately, they think that theropods between 27 and 1,044 kilograms, or 60 to 2,300 pounds, would have, quote, gained a significant energetic advantage over individuals at both small and large extremes of theropod body mass through their scavenging efficiency, end quote. And those relative benefits were consistent with varying detection abilities from 200 meters to 2 kilometers, or 650 feet to 1.25 miles. So basically, it could get confounded if, say, a T-Rex could sense something 2 kilometers away, and a very small animal could only sense it 200 meters away. But with their data, it looked like even with differences in detecting ability, If you were too big, it still wasn't really worth it to be scavenging. I think this actually kind of fits in well with the whole T-Rex being a facultative scavenger hypothesis, because if you're hunting, which it looks like T-Rex likely would have, because solely scavenging might have taken more energy than it would have been worth, you would be getting all the food that you need to get. But if you find some scavenged thing that you can scare off the other predators from now all of a sudden you kind of get a free meal easy meal yeah when i take leftovers out of the fridge (laughs) it's all about food with sabrina it is (laughs) next we got a great article from chris so thanks chris for sending us this one it's titled dinosaurs in decline tens of millions of years before their final extinction It was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and written by Manabu Sakamoto, Michael J. Benton, and Chris Venditti. And actually, we will be talking to Dr. Sakamoto next week about this study. Yeah, so we'll get a little more clarity on a couple of these things. But it's an interesting article that came up recently, so we wanted to talk about it. First off, despite the title, you might think, oh, okay, This is one of those articles where they say dinosaurs were killed off by something other than a meteor. But they do explicitly recognize that the Chicxulub impactor caused dinosaurs to go extinct. But they do not believe the dinosaurs were as dominant as they had been earlier in their reign. And that's really what the article's about. And it would be the craziest coincidence ever if one of the largest impacts in the geologic record coincided within less than a million years of the extinction of the dinosaurs who were around for over a hundred million years. And they don't think that was a coincidence, (laughs) for the record. 
their primary method was comparing the number of dinosaur species throughout the times that they were around. So they say that 231 million years ago, in the late Triassic, dinosaurs were diversifying rapidly with lots of new species popping up and filling all the individual niches, and everything is peachy. <laughs> dinosaurs are doing great. Then 160 million years ago, in the late Jurassic, the growth began to slow, and they point out sauropods aren't doing quite as well as they used to. Oh no! I know. But there's still a lot of diversification going on and everything. And then 120 million years ago, which is pretty much in the middle of the Cretaceous, the number of species starts declining. And they use that as an indicator to say that dinosaurs aren't doing as well as they used to do. And there are other animals that are now competing with them and maybe winning a little bit. Like maybe small mammals are taking over certain niches or maybe aquatic animals or who knows what. But in any event, dinosaurs aren't doing as well as they used to. It was interesting that in the interviews that I was reading, they said they weren't expecting the result. And I like that because that means that it's not just confirmation bias skewing their conclusion. They actually were looking at the number of dinosaurs and seeing what they could find out. And ultimately, they found out there were less of them. So that leads them to believe that dinosaurs weren't doing as well. It's pretty simple. We look at a lot of phylogenetic trees, like with titanosaurs last week, and the diversification and how they're doing, and the ones I look at usually look like there are a lot of new species evolving well into the late Cretaceous, but I suppose since they're looking at dinosaurs as a whole and not just a specific family or superfamily, they weren't looking at if specific dinosaurs are doing well in evolving, but really whether or not dinosaurs as a whole are filling all the available niches or if there are other animals that are starting to compete with them. So I think that's kind of an important distinction. I think dinosaurs and a lot of the groups were still doing really well, like hadrosaurs and some of the other ones, but dinosaurs weren't completely dominating the entire <laughs> land ecosystem, basically. They said that their best guess for why dinosaurs were declining was climate change, which makes some sense because we know that the temperature on Earth dropped quite a bit between the Triassic and the Cretaceous, and we know that cooler temperatures can be difficult for really big animals. We've seen other extinction events that have been attributed to changes in temperature. And they also assert that mammals may have eventually taken over even without the Chicxulub impact which is something I'm definitely going to ask them more about when we talk to them, because <laughs> I think that's probably the most controversial thing they said. And next in the news, we talked about this a few months back when it was first happening. Nicolas Cage had bought a Tarbosaurus skull, although for some reason a lot of people thought it was a T-Rex skull, and it turned out to be stolen from Mongolia. So now that skull has officially been approved to go back to Mongolia by a judge in New York. That's all the details I could find, so I'm not really sure why a judge had to say it was okay to go back to Mongolia. Yeah, I kind of wonder if they're referring to that, what was it called, ceremony? <laughs> oh, could be. <laughs> From a couple of weeks ago where in New York they turned over a bunch of fossils to the Mongolian officials. That might be what they're talking about. That could be, I guess, make everything formal. So just as a recap again, Nicolas Cage bought this skull in 2007 in an auction for $230,000, and the skull came to the U.S. in 2006 via Japan, and now it's going back to Mongolia. Back to its rightful owner. A museum? Probably. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> or just some government official that wants it. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of museums, the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa, Florida is hosting a dinosaur festival which sounds awesome, and visitors can touch fossils and learn about how to find fossils in Florida, as well as see presentations on fossil hunting. And this coincides with the museum's final weeks with the Dinosaurs in Motion exhibit and the showing of the IMAX documentary Dinosaurs Alive! Next, we've talked a little bit about the Jurassic World exhibition at the Melbourne Museum in Australia, and Gizmodo posted a review. I wish we could find a way to go to Australia this year. Apparently, there are some science exhibits that explain how DNA works in the Jurassic World, the exhibition. But of course, the main attraction is the animatronic dinosaurs, which Jack Horner helped to create. So in addition to Brachiosaurus, Stegosaurus, and T-Rex, there is an Indominus Rex. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and there's a video that shows the Indominus Rex being unveiled. 
I wonder if it can change its skin color. That would be cool, but I have no idea. We'll have to go to Melbourne yeah. and find out. I guess so. <laughs> Hopefully it stays there long enough. <laughs> it's only for a few more months this oh, year. Oh, no. I know. Maybe it'll move closer to us. Maybe. That'd be nice. The Atlantic City Convention Center in New Jersey had this interactive dinosaur exhibit that apparently drew in 10,000 visitors. The exhibit was called Discover the Dinosaurs Unleashed, and it had animatronic dinosaurs, a T-Rex ride, where I guess kids could ride an animatronic T-Rex, and educational tidbits for the kids. I wonder what the size limit was for the riding the animatronic T-Rex. Like, could an adult, could a small adult Probably smaller one? than you. Hmm, that's too bad. Then it'd be kind of like real life, like the ARC game. It would be. I want to ride a dinosaur. Go to New Jersey. And dress up like a small child. <laughs> Six foot three man rides T-Rex and gets arrested by New Jersey police. I see a headline in my future. I don't know about arrested. <laughs> Reprimanded. Maybe. Gets thrown out of convention center. Maybe. In British Columbia, Canada, sad news, somebody vandalized a velociraptor sculpture that stood at the front of the Exploration Place Museum plus Science Center. According to the CEO of the museum, Tracy Caligaros, quote, Our velociraptor was minding his own business in the explorer's urban garden this weekend, but someone felt the need to try and steal him. When they couldn't remove him, they destroyed him. End no. Quote. Yeah, it's pretty sad. So I guess the vandals, they cut open a fence, and then I guess they tried to move the velociraptor, but it was too big. So the museum now plans to fix the fence and maybe even add razor wire for more protection. British Columbia. Mm-hmm. Yikes. Yeah. At first I was hoping that they vandalized it, quote-unquote, by, like, sticking a bunch of feathers on it or something. <laughs> yeah. Something that didn't involve destroying it. Clive Palmer, the owner of the Palmer Coulomb Resort on the Sunshine Coast in Australia, seems to have been the target of a prank. A couple people put his life-size dinosaur replicas up for sale online, We've mentioned Clive Palmer before, and he had his life-size dinosaur replicas. Anyway, they said, quote, they knew he is in a spot of bother at the moment and needs to get some cash fast. We thought we could do something to help. He is also quite busy, so we thought we would sell on his behalf. And some people have actually offered to buy these dinosaurs for as high as $450 for a velociraptor. According to one of the posters of the ads, Quote, part of the reason for doing this is that given Mr. Palmer treats politics as a bit of a joke, we thought we would treat his dinosaurs as a joke, so apparently they were upset with him. That's pretty annoying. It's kind of funny. Kind of. I feel kind of bad for him. $450 is way low for yes. that, too. Well, that was part of the article they're saying. Well, they don't really know that the quality of these dinosaurs. Speaking of life-size dinosaurs, in San Luis Obispo, California, there were some iron life-size dinosaurs wandering around in a field on Huasna Townsite Road. We'll post a link with pictures, but it looks like there was a Triceratops, Diplodocus, and a T-Rex without a tail. In Oregon, Forest Grove specifically, they had a pretty slow news day, and they posted a story about a boy in a dinosaur costume who wandered around a park and scared a couple girls. The story was picked up on Reddit along with a poll, quote, What should be done about this child who wears a dinosaur costume? One, he should be declared a local hero and replace the Unipiper. Two, like all children and dinosaurs, he should be declared extinct. Three, he should be tranquilized and taken to an island populated with dinosaurs who were created from prehistoric DNA. Nothing bad will happen. Four, he should be the subject of an actual news story produced by an actual local TV news station desperately looking for something, anything, to write about. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah, I like the poll better than the story. Actually, I think that poll is longer than the news story. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Speaking of scary dinosaurs... I know that's a bit of a stretch because that probably wasn't that scary. No. <laughs> There's been a leak that a new Resident Evil game is coming out sometime this year called Resident Evil 7, at least for now, unless they come up with some other name for it. And bloodydisgusting.com, pretty bad title for a website, but it, they're taking advantage of the hype with a new article about Resident Evil games that feature dinosaurs. And the author thinks that they were some of the best Resident Evil games. They point to a list of Resident Evil games from the 90s 
that were made better by adding dinosaurs. <laughs> and ultimately, the success of those games led to the same creator making a game called Dino Crisis that we talked about back in episode 62, as well as Dino Crisis 2, which were both very successful and both survival horror type games with dinosaurs trying to eat you and kill you. But apparently Dino Crisis 3 kind of took a different method and it was like a third person shooter and it was awful and then the series just stopped because they decided uh eh, people are tired of dinosaur games. But really they just Wrong. made it yeah. They just made a terrible game and <laughs> should have stuck with the survival horror probably. The end of the article says, quote, if Jurassic World can come out over 15 years after Jurassic Park 3 and set box office world records in the process, then there's still plenty of hope for the crazy folks within Dino Crisis, end quote, which I think is a pretty good argument for sticking more dinosaurs into video games like Resident Evil 7. <laughs> so we Maybe there'll be see. a surprise. Yeah. And I'm sure that would make a game more scary. So I hope that Resident Evil 7 has dinosaurs, even though I don't think it's particularly likely since it's been quite a while and quite a few Resident Evil games since there was a dinosaur in there. And if they do have dinosaurs, I hope that they add feathers because I think that would be one of the best ways to convince people that dinosaurs with feathers can be scary is sticking them in a Resident Evil survival horror game where you're getting terrified by these feathered dinosaurs attacking you. Yeah, Dakota Raptor. Could be awesome. <laughs> but and we'll see. terrifying. Yeah, I don't usually play survival horror games, but if they add dinosaurs to Resident Evil 7, I will have to, for sure. Speaking of games, this is a very different kind of game. You can now play Steve the Jumping Dinosaur in the iOS Notification Center. This is according to TechCrunch. We've actually talked about this game before. It's this really simple game where you play as Steve the T-Rex. I didn't know he had a name, but his name is Steve. Yeah, it's just a picture with no introduction or anything, so you wouldn't know his name. Yeah, and you jump over cactus and rocks using a space bar if you're on a desktop or a laptop. You can play the game when Chrome times out and you hit your space bar. It starts the game. Yeah, there's like a dinosaur and it says like, oh no, something went wrong or connection's bad or something like that. And then if you hit space, the dinosaur starts running. Yeah. So now you can play this game in your iPhone notification center. Apparently it's the number 15 top game in the US App Store, which is impressive. <laughs> it's got that flappy bird-like simplicity to it. Also looks very pixelated. Yeah. Except much easier than Flappy Bird. It's more like Sonic or something. And no color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next, it seems that more and more dinosaur jewelry is being talked about. And the latest is a diamond necklace that happens to contain dinosaur bones designed by Monique Pien. And it was handmade in New York and inspired by a trip to Utah. It retails for $64,160 US dollars at Barney's in New York. Oof. This is probably because of the 18 karat white gold and other gems. I'm guessing not because of the dinosaur bones, but maybe they're playing it off as, so oh, fossilized millions of years in the making or something like that. That is a lot going on there. Yeah. I don't know how much overlap there is with Barney's clientele and paleontologists. It's all about the marketing. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Next, thanks to David who shared this one with us via Facebook. Nine Gag posted an image of a detailed carnivorous dinosaur on the back of a truck with the headline, Wash Me. It's pretty realistic. We'll post a link on our blog. It's actually a pretty impressive image. And last, thanks to Advigo Ego on Twitter for sharing this picture with us. It's a T-Rex that was at PAX East 2016 this year. The people making the game Ark tweeted this image. It looks like there's a woman on top riding a T-Rex, which makes sense since you can do that in the game. And the tweet says, hashtag PaxRex is taking on its final form. Don't worry, it'll have arms. Oh, I didn't even notice it didn't have arms since mm. everything else is so large. Come see it finished at PAX East 2016, number 8092. That must have been their booth number. So if you were at the conference in Boston this year, and hopefully you got to see it. It seems cool. like it would be hard to miss. It's so large. And that's it for the news. Now on to the dinosaur of the day. 
Scipionix samniticus, also known as Ciro, and this was a request from Ricardo via Patreon, so thanks Ricardo. The name means Scipio's Claw, and it was a consignathid that lived in the early Cretaceous in Italy, and it was named in 1998. It's famous because paleontologists found lots of soft tissue and internal organs, including muscles and intestines, and it was the first dinosaur discovered in Italy, so it's a pretty big deal. That is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. I love it when they find soft tissue because it's so rare. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I love it when they find dinosaurs in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I know of any other dinosaurs that were found in Italy, so. <laughs> it's also rare. There's only one fossil found of Scipionics, and it was discovered in 1981 by amateur paleontologist Giovanni Tedesco, and he thought it was an extinct bird. Tedesco prepared the fossil in his basement using vinyl glue, and he added a fake tail, and he nicknamed the fossil Little Doggy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goofiest, like, Which is interesting if he discovery. thought it was an extinct bird. Yeah, and then he put it together in his basement and just stuck a tail on it. It's so funny. Yeah. A little unfortunate, though. I'll get into that later. In 1993, Giorgio Taruzzi from the Museo Civico di Storia Naturale di Milano learned about the fossil and said it was a juvenile theropod, and he nicknamed it Ambrosio after Ambrose, the patron saint of Milan. Taruzzi also enlisted the help of his colleague, Father Giuseppe Leonardi. In Italy, this fossil find belongs to the government, and Tedesco ended up giving the fossil to the archaeological directorship at Naples in October in 1993. And also in 93, Taruzzi and Leonardi reported the fossil scientifically. They reported it, didn't officially name it. And the magazine Ogi nicknamed it Ciro, a, quote, typical Neapolitan boy's name, end quote. Marco Signor from the University of Naples, Federico, wrote a thesis in 1995 naming the fossil Dromeo Damon Irene, but the paper was unpublished, so the name was not used. Sergio Rampinelli worked on the fossil for 300 hours to restore it. He had to replace the glue and remove the fake tail. That's why it's a little bit unfortunate. And that's when he found all the soft tissue. That sounds like less time than it would have taken him starting from scratch, though. Because you hear about them spending over a thousand hours sometimes if you're just starting from a rock. Could be. Hard to say, though. It is. It's also a small dinosaur. Yeah. Marco Signor and Cristiano Dal Sasso named and described Ciro as Scipionix, and it was featured on the front cover of Nature in 1998. The first paper that Cristiano Dal Sasso and Marco Signor wrote was called Exceptional Soft Tissue Preservation in a Theropod Dinosaur from Italy, published in Nature. The name Scipio is for... Scipion Breslak, a geologist from the 18th century who first described the formation Petraroria Platincock, where Ciro was found, and for Cornelius Scipio, nicknamed Africanus, who was a famous Roman consul who fought in the Mediterranean area. The species name Samniticus means from Samnium, which is the, quote, ancient name of the region, including the Benevento province. Other potential names for this dinosaur were Italosaurus, Italoraptor, and Microraptor. Interesting how Microraptor keeps getting thrown around. Yeah. The holotype is nearly complete and includes the lower legs and a claw on the right second finger. Cristiano Del Sassa and Marco Signor further studied the fossil in 2005 to 2008 and wrote an extensive monograph in 2011 about Ciro. The specimen found is of a very young dinosaur, maybe only three days old. They wow. know. Yeah, so there's this large empty space between the back of its intestines and the pubic shafts, and it may have had a yolk sac that it had from hatching, and it would have used that yolk sac to help give it more nutrients during the first couple weeks after hatching. Hmm. The size of the yolk sac means that it was probably only three days old, or maybe even a week old. What's interesting is that juvenile theropod dinosaur discoveries are pretty scarce. Even though Ciro was so young, it could already walk. And Del Sassa and Signor estimated it to be 18 inches, or 46 centimeters long, including the missing tail, which is only a little smaller than Allosaurus hatchlings. But because it's Compsognathidae, an adult, Scipionix, probably only grew to be 93 inches, or 237 meters long, which is the same size as Xenocalyopteryx, the largest known Compsognathid. They found eight unique traits in Ciro, including five teeth in the premaxilla on each side and a wrist with only two bones. It had a straight, long, lower jaw with ten teeth on each side, and the jawbone is low. It had seven teeth in the maxilla on each side, and a total of 44 teeth in all. Because it was so young, it hadn't replaced any of its teeth yet, and the teeth curved gradually. 
It had a large skull with large eye sockets, probably because it was so young, and it had a pointed snout with a rounded tip. It was missing a lower leg, but it had a relatively long slender neck and long hind limbs and forelimbs. It was bipedal and a predator. It probably had a long tail. The claws on its hands are somewhat curved. It had a short hand, though, for a compsognathid. It probably also had primitive feathers. This is based on relatives. No skin or evidence of feathers have been found. But lots of soft tissues were preserved, including some blood vessels, cartilage, connective tissue, bone tissue, muscle tissue, and parts of the respiratory and digestive systems. The original bone tissue isn't there, but calcium phosphate mineralization preserved the bone cell structure. Only a piece of the trachea, part of the respiratory system, is preserved, and it's a very thin piece, about one millimeter wide. You can also see horn sheaths of hand claws. The liver was also preserved in the right shape, which helps to show the relative positions of internal organs. So what they saw was this large reddish area, and they concluded that that was the liver. In 1999, a study by Rubin and some others found that Ciro had a respiratory system similar to a crocodile's because of its large liver. But Del Sasso and Signor, their study in 2011, found that the liver may have been distorted in fossilization and just looks bigger. Also, some birds have large livers, so they concluded it was probably more bird-like than crocodile-like. Yeah, I can't. We talk about some of the things that change with bones after decomposing, but I can't even imagine some of the things that change with soft tissue. Yeah. That can, you know, change shape, size, position pretty easily. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. They also found some semi-digested lizards and fish in the gut, so they're thinking maybe the parents fed it to this baby because it's unlikely that this three-day-old dinosaur could catch lizards or fish itself or even bite them into pieces and swallow by itself. Yeah. There's no stomach acid on the bones in the stomach, so the meal was less than a day old. Cyril was probably an opportunistic generalist eater. He would eat fast lizards and fish that washed ashore. It lived in an area with shallow lagoons, and there was also a lot of small islands. It was probably one of the bigger animals in its habitat. It possibly immigrated from North Africa somewhat recently. And if you want to see Scipionix, it got its own display in 2002 at the Museo Archaeologico di Benevento. So you can see it there. Ciro was, again, a compsognathid, and compsognathids are small carnivorous dinosaurs. This group includes compsognathids, Cenosauroteryx, Xenocalyopteryx, and Juravenator. They lived in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, and they had feathers and some had scales. And some compsognathids are considered to be basal celurosaurs, but others are considered to be part of Manoraptora. Cool. And our fun fact of the day is a little bit of a continuation of last week when I was talking about eggs. So there are lots of different types of fossilized eggs. But according to Konstantin Mikhailov and others in Parataxonomy of Fossil Egg Remains, published in Taylor and Francis, there are six basic eggshell types. There's testardoid, which is basically the green sea turtle type of egg. There's geckoid, which comes from geckos. There's crocodiloid, which, not surprisingly, comes from crocodilia. Then there's dinosauroids spherulitic, which is sauropods and ornithopods mostly, and dinosauroid prismatic, which is mostly protoceratopsids and hypsilophodontids. And then there's ornithoid, which is theropoda and modern birds. So out of the six type of basic eggshells, three of them are dinosaur eggs. <laughs> Way to dominate. So if someone says, what came first, the chicken or the egg, you say, the dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my answer from now on. I can see that. Or maybe the dinosaur egg. Depends on which way you want to go. Depends on your mood. Yeah. Or if you want to be really annoying, you could say, the dinosauroid spherulitic egg. I don't think you'll remember that. I won't. I'm just going to say the dinosaur. <laughs> Good choice. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and if you like what you hear, you're a dinosaur enthusiast, then support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.